Welcome to Electrified, it's your host, Dylan Loomis. So real quick, thank you to Kyle and Alexandra, my two newest patrons, I appreciate you guys and everybody else. But did you guys happen to see this yesterday? It was trending on Twitter for a while from the Telegraph environment. NASA warning of a wobble in the moon's orbit that is set to see the world face significantly more natural disasters. An onslaught of coastal flooding starting in the mid 2030s is expected, NASA has warned. Now, I don't know about your experience, but mine with the weather prediction has been that they struggle to predict things 30 minutes out, but now they're saying what's going to happen over a decade from now. Color me a little bit skeptical, but what they are saying is that the number of floods could quadruple as the gravitational effects of the lunar cycle combined with the climate change to produce a decade of dramatic increases in water disasters. Coastal cities would experience rapidly increasing high tide floods lasting a month or longer. And they're saying what's new is how one of the wobble's effects on the moon's gravitational pull, which by the way is the main cause of the Earth's tides, will combine with rising sea levels resulting from the planet's warming. So of course, I would love to hear your thoughts on this below. And in response to a solving the money problem video, Elon gave us some more insight into the lawsuit that is suing him and Tesla. So that law firm is Robbins Geller, was formed by the lawyers who managed to escape prison for bearing false witness, kickbacks, and bribes when they were at Milberg Weiss. They just moved across the street and changed their name, but they're the same people. He added, then the founder of Robbins Geller, Bill Lirak, who clearly had not learned his lesson, was sent to prison. So maybe after that, Robbins Geller learned their lesson? Of course not. Once again, bearing false witness. And Elon did share a few links. I'm not going to go into detail there, but I have included them below if you would like to read further. And then he said, amazingly, all of this quite relevant information is missing from their Puff Piece Wikipedia page, which has obviously been whitewashed watched by paid curators. Easy to tell that my wiki is not curated as it is a messy hellscape, which I thought was pretty funny. But from the Robbins Geller Wikipedia page, K10 shared, wow, William Shannon Lirak, disbarred lawyer who specialized in private securities class action lawsuits, $7 billion he obtained as the lead plaintiff attorney case against Enron, currently the largest sum ever recorded in group of securities class action lawsuits US history. And this guy pleaded guilty, and this guy pleaded guilty guilty a while ago to one count of conspiracy for paying millions of dollars in kickbacks, part of why he ended up going to prison. So a long story short, the guys that are suing Elon and Tesla over this Solar City deal definitely don't have a squeaky clean track record. And here we have an interesting news piece. Tesla has removed the long range Model 3 dual motor from the Chinese configurator. So with regard to the Model 3 right now in China, only the Model 3 Standard Range Plus and the Model 3 Performance are available to be ordered. And yes, this is confirmed. As you can see, the Tesla China configurator translated to English, you only have the Standard Range Plus and the Performance no long range version available. And so of course the question becomes, why is Tesla doing this? Well, first and foremost, I think they are focusing on the Model Y, prioritizing that vehicle now with the standard range version being available in China, and they are set to export the Model Y to Europe in quarter three. This is a big deal because of course, the only advertising that Tesla is going to have for the Model Y at Giga Berlin is going to be cars on the road, which they don't have a ton of right now. So getting a few of these Model Ys out in the areas around Giga Berlin is going to be the best form of advertising ahead of actual production, local production at Giga Berlin. And look, we have to remember Tesla has all of the granular data in terms of demand for each specific model and the battery supply capacity and the chip shortages. So they have all the data that we don't have. So we just have to trust that they know what they're doing. And of course they do. So are they prioritizing the Model Y because it has higher profit margins? Maybe is it because the demand for the Model Y is going to be significantly greater than the Model 3 long range? Possibly, but simply put, they are obviously still production constrained to some degree. So they are just going to prioritize to get the Model Y out in higher capacity, both in Shanghai and also in the areas surrounding Giga Berlin as they start to export the Model Y over there. And if you remember, Giga Berlin was initially set to start producing vehicles this month, July of 2021. So that is clearly not the case. But of course, Tesla wants to get some of these early adopters and reservation holders their cars. So once again, it will be great advertising ahead of production later this year. The more cars on the road that people start to see, the more the hype builds and the demand will ultimately be once they can start producing at Giga Berlin. So Car and Driver did this EV1000 top 10 where Tesla took the top three slots. This wasn't like a race. This was basically a road trip test to see which cars did the best in a road trip setting in terms of 
range and charging efficiency and all of that. To which Elon replied, not bad, although the new Model S has more range and faster charging. The 3 and Y also should have used a long range version. They use the performance as the performance version is meant for max speed and handling, not max range. But here's the real news. The supercharger network is being upgraded to 300 kilowatts up from the 250 kilowatts right now, which is version three. So that will help too. And this brings up all kinds of questions that sadly Elon hasn't answered yet, but questions like, will the existing Model 3 and Model Ys be able to charge at these speeds? Or will it only be for new vehicles, you know, Cybertruck, Roadster, etc.? A lot of people are now speculating that the Model S Plaid will be the first vehicle capable of these 300 kilowatt speeds, which definitely does make some sense. And part of the reason for that assumption is that the Plaid is running a 450 volt system where the Model 3 and Model Ys are running a 400 volt system. And this is an interesting point here that a lot of people don't really talk about. I've noticed other EVs seem to be increasingly adopting 800 volt systems, think Porsche Taycan, rather than the 400 volt systems that Tesla uses. This person asks, so why would Tesla not choose to adopt the 800 volt system? And from the little bit that I know about this space, this seems to be a very accurate answer. The electronic components that are rated for at least 400 volts are common because industrial three phase electricity is 415 volts. So basically everything from the cars to the charger can utilize these components. 800 volts is much less common in industry. So those parts may cost more to source and redesigning everything, all of this architecture is not trivial. Tesla has a million cars on the road and thousands of superchargers and they all use 400 volts. There are huge economies of scale there that are lost if they move to 800 volts and their parts become fragmented. This is not to say that Tesla won't go to 800 volts in the future, it's just they have little incentive to do so right now. And if you go back, why did Porsche go through the trouble of switching to 800 volts when everything else is on 400? Porsche took a considerable engineering challenge when it decided the 800 volt system for the Taycan because basically everybody else is still on 400. There simply was not a wide range of high voltage off the shelf parts that have been rigorously tested for the high demands of the automotive world, different climates and locations, etc. And as mentioned, you would basically have to redesign a lot of different components and parts, everything from power semiconductors to the insulation. And if you wanna learn more about this 400 volt versus 800 volt discussion, I've included this podcast below. It was actually really good and helpful. So if you wanna learn more, go ahead and check that out. And I tweeted earlier today about this 20% increase in charging speeds for the V3 Tesla superchargers, and that will make these already great numbers look that much better. Go ahead and take a screenshot of this if you wanna look, but it's basically comparing Tesla and Ford's charging capabilities at the moment. And a last important note, the supercharger V3 stations don't split power between nearby vehicles. So previously at one stall or one station, if there were two cars, you had to share the power, but version three means that every user of the next network is able to charge at the full power that their battery of course can take. So I would guess if we don't get any more information on this before the quarter two earnings call on July 26th, then someone will ask the question hopefully and Elon will give us some details. And I don't know what's going on here, but Sam shared this chart about women having fewer children. And then someone said, we'd like a girl please. And Elon said, me too. Then he said, the next baby will be a girl. So is this an announcement that he is having another baby, that he's having a girl? Is this just a plan for the future? I don't know, people are asking the same question and he hasn't responded yet, so. But knowing Elon, this could mean a number of things, so only time will tell. A quick reminder here on this tweet, a lot of people are getting this confused, just this one line. Tesla makes their own chips to train their neural nets. So Tesla designs their own chips. When people say make, they immediately tie that to manufacture. Tesla does not manufacture their own chips. They are still relying on Samsung and other companies to make the chips, they just design them. So. Remember that because it's important, especially given the state of the chip industry. A quick Starlink update. So Christopher shared some of his download and upload speeds using Starlink in a rural area. Elon said, glad it's working. The sheer amount of work done by SpaceX engineering production and launch teams is amazing. The ping should improve dramatically in the coming months. We're aiming for less than 20 milliseconds. Basically, you should be able to play competitive first person shooter games through Starlink. Is ping being improved due to new satellites with better hardware or just more satellites on Earth's orbit? 
More ground stations and less foolish packet routing will make the biggest differences. Looking at speed of light as 300 kilometers per millisecond and satellite altitude of 550 kilometers, the average photon round trip time is only around 10 milliseconds, so a lot of silly things have to happen to drive ping above 20 milliseconds. And then Pernay asks, does having laser links, which are present in the newer satellites, help in improving speeds and reducing latency, or they're mainly to provide internet connection in the polar regions? And Elon said the laser links in orbit can reduce long distance latency by as much as 50% due to higher speed of light in vacuum and shorter path than undersea fibers. So maybe in the coming weeks here, we'll do another updated deep dive on SpaceX and Starlink. But for those of you that are following it, there's your update. And a quick note on Tesla in South Korea, the Model 3 is the best selling model in the country. Electric car sales in South Korea increased in the first half of 2021 to 26,600 units and two Teslas are in the top three models. According to the the Korea Automobile Importers and Distributors Association, Tesla sold 11,600 cars during this time, which is 64% more than in 2020, and makes up about 44% of the entire electric vehicle segment sales. So 44% of EV market share, once again, a very strong number where Tesla is still developing a brand image. And some more quick news on the Model Y HEPA filter and the retrofit options in case you guys missed it. It is true that all Model Y vehicles that are produced without the HEPA filters will have access to an optional upgrade sometime in the coming weeks or months. As you heard, if you've been with the channel for at least a few days, the new filters were installed in cars that were produced at Fremont after July 1st of this year. But then Sawyer Merritt answered the question that a lot of people had. A source told me that Tesla will offer HEPA filter retrofits for Model Ys that were made before July 1st of this year. The system will be sold online on the Tesla shop as well as in the app. Retrofits will require service appointments. And that Tesla will provide an exact timeline for retrofits at a later date. And it's this HEPA filter that will enable the bioweapon defense mode that initially when Elon launched this, everybody thought it was a gimmick, but it turns out that it does incredible work when it comes to filtering the air that is coming into the cabin. And with all of the wildfires and everything going on around the world and the really poor air quality that most people really overlook that leads to a ton of health problems. This is a way bigger deal than much people are really understanding. And yesterday there was an article about Volkswagen's plans for the next decade. There was some interesting stuff in there, but I'm not going into it because they are just plans and I'm really only concerned with what other automakers are executing right now, not just what they're talking about doing. But if you're following Volkswagen and interested in their story, I have linked this article below. And I'm going to send you off today with a trending news story about GM and the Chevy Bolt and the fires. And look, subconsciously as a Tesla fan, you wanna take this news story and champion it around, basically saying, hey, stop coming at Tesla. Everybody else is having cars catch on fire too. It's not just us, like stop blasting Tesla for one when, other automakers are having the same problem. The problem is that's a bad look for the EV industry at large because you're gonna have people that watch the media and don't know a lot about electric vehicles see these news stories and think to themselves, well, I'm never gonna buy an electric vehicle because I like being alive and I don't want my house to catch on fire. And the truth is even one fire, whether it's Tesla or Chevy, it doesn't matter what the automaker is, it's too many. We need this technology to be better, safer, cheaper, more effective, all of those things. And these type of headlines are not painting the picture that that's where the EV industry is at. So here's the news, but please take a second to like the video if you did. I hope you guys have an awesome day and a big thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. This is one of those stories that as it continues to develop, General Motors is trying to get their arms around this as quickly as possible, not only for the sake of the Bolt owners, but also because EVs are the future for General Motors. Let's talk first of all about this warning from General Motors that it issued yesterday it impacts about 69,000 Chevy Bolts between 27 and 2019 model years. They are, the owners are being told two things. One, do not charge this vehicle overnight unattended and also park it outside after it's charging. In other words, they don't want it in your garage because of the potential for a fire risk. There have been eight Chevy Bolt fires, and we're going to show you pics of a Chevy Bolt that caught on fire last week. This is what's left after a bolt fire. This bolt, by the way, belongs to a Vermont lawmaker who has been a supporter and an advocate for electric vehicles. It caught fire after charging. There, the interesting thing here is this fire happened after it had been repaired. Back in November, when this issue first came up, General Motors issued a recall to uh, address anomalies in battery cells that might cause some fires and some issues with the batteries. This is one of the cars that was fixed, and yet it still caught fire. GM is starting its EV push this fall, so that's why it wants to get this issue 
addressed as quickly as possible. This is the Cadillac Lyric. That comes out this fall. Then you've got the all-electric Hummer Sport Utility Truck. That's going to be a big push for General Motors. That's coming later this year. GM has set a goal for selling 1 million electric vehicles annually by 2025. So this is the future, and this is also a big reason why shares of General Motors have been moving higher in the last year. The optimism that is out there amongst investors that GM will be not only competitive, but a leader when it comes to electric vehicles. 